All right. So should we just go ahead and get started then? All right, everyone. So thank you for joining us on this Saturday. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Fabio Nascimento. Um, he just finished up his epilepsy um, fellowship at Mass General Hospital and is now a practicing adult epileptologist at Washington University. Um, we're really excited to have worked with Fabio several times in the past, but most recently on um, a survey to caregivers asking about transition. And today he's going to talk to us about the results of that survey and what he's learned about transition of healthcare. Thanks, Fabio. Yeah, thank you, Veronica Marianne. I'm really excited to show you all our, our results. Um, so before we start, I think it's the more informal, the better. So if there's any comments or anything comes up, or, uh, just stop me anytime and then we can we can talk about that and, and keep going. So the more informal, the better. And um, so I picked this, this is a new slide for me. I picked this bridge here because I think it just portrays what we're trying to really accomplish, which is to nicely um, um, connect two sides, which are the pediatric and the adult on one side. Um, and although they're different, um, they have their advantages, disadvantages, it's just two, two systems, but they can be merged together. And I think it's our job now to, to make that happen. So, um, so yeah, just a little bit of more background. I, I've been working with Marianne and Veronica and the foundation for a while. Uh, and this is one of our most recent projects where we, we asked um, caregivers to really tell us what's, what's going on and what issues they face and how we can improve um, as a community. So I'm really excited to, to talk a little bit about what we found. Um, so I will keep going. Um, just some disclosures, I'm not going to go over them, not really relevant to this study in particular. Um, and um, so let's start here. Um, I think this is it's nice to have a kind of overview of how um, um, providers see um, from an adult side, how we see Dravet syndrome. So I think we can break down uh, genetic epilepsies, including Dravet, in, in two groups. Uh, one being the new adults that we diagnose in clinic, um, which are, are so undiagnosed. So patients with Dravet that never got tested, never got um, clinically diagnosed. So they have this you know, cerebral palsy or um, cryptogenic, idiopathic, symptomatic, a lot, of, a lot of terms that just mean that we don't know what's really going on. And we, um, uh, and we make the diagnosis in the adult clinic. So that's one option. And that's not what we're gonna talk about today too much. Um, the other um, avenue to, to patient with Dravet coming to our side, um, the adult side, is really through, through the pediatric hospital, and that's where the transition um, comes about, really. And this is just a, a picture of our uh, Western University St. Louis Children's Hospital um, that I'm working with to create the transition program here at WashU. So, so we're going to focus on the transition uh, patients more, more so today. So before we, we talk about our project in particular and what we found, I think it's really important to review uh, what's been recommended as far as um, uh, uh, what's really needed to make sure that a smooth transition happens for, for patients that need transition, um, uh, both from a pediatric provider standpoint and adult provider standpoint. Just one caveat to that. This is the, uh, these are the, they're called the eight common principles of transition that were proposed by the Child Neurology Society. Um, uh, so they're, they should include patients with um, neurologic disorders, uh, not necessarily epilepsy, but they include also epilepsy. But just to make that distinction, um, these are supposed to be more broad versus narrow to epilepsy and even more narrow to to Dravet syndrome. Uh, but, you know, knowing that and having said that, then let's just go over the eight principles really quickly. So from the top here, so number one, uh, there's the expectation um, of, of uh, this talking to the patient and caregiver about a potential upcoming tr imminent transition by the 30th uh, birthday, 13th birthday. Um, so it needs to start pretty early and we'll compare with what's been happening in our community in a little bit. So that's principle number one. 
Principle number two is that there is an, uh, the, the team uh, assures that there's some sort of assessment of the patient's self-management skills at age 12 years and then every year thereafter. Um, so let me just stop for one second. Veronica, I think I'm getting this admit, non-admit for new participants. Are you getting that as well? Should I click on admit or just disregard? Okay. You can click admit. I don't see okay. anything on mine, but yeah, go ahead. Cool. Sorry about that. No, no, no worries. All right, so second principle here is to make sure that the pediatric, this is all pediatric so far. So the pediatric team uh, assesses the patient's self-management skills at the age of 12 and, and, and uh, annually thereafter. The third principle is that, again, the pediatric team um, engages both the patient and caregivers in this planning of the transition. So it's a phase transition planning uh, and then ed make the education accordingly and um, uh, complete this transfer readiness at least annually starting at the age of 13, which uh, is a questionnaire that asks a bunch of different questions about the patient and the caregivers being um, educated and ready and, and kind of set expectations and next steps as far as the transition process. So that's the, the third. Fourth is that again, the pediatric team talks about expect a legal competency and decision-making capacity by the 14th birthday. Um, so again, that's something the pediatric team should be doing with, with patients with neurologic, chronic neurologic disorders. Um, just four more. So the, um, the one at the top there, the fifth, is that there's a, a, a comprehensive multidisciplinary transition plan by the 14th birthday. So um, again, going back to the, the discussion should start around the 13th birthday and then around four, 14th birthday. Ideally, um, this transition plan and multidisciplinary and comprehensive approach should be in place. Um, uh, so that's number six. Uh, sixth uh, principle is that the team developed, the pediatric team develops and verifies the neurologic component of the transition plan and updates annually. So just to, to go, it goes to show here that, that it's not just a new, from a neurologic standpoint that needs to, to be taken care of as far as transition, but there's other components of the transition process that need to be addressed and, and, um, and, uh, and taken care of um, in the process as well. And then the last two are more to do with us. And in our survey, focus more on these two because they're more related to the adult side of, of care. Um, so the seventh is that the team in collaboration with the patient and caregivers really identify someone from the adult side as far as providers, um, uh, so epileptologists or adult or general neurologists that uh, they're appropriate for the neurologic condition before the transfer. Um, so I know that's that's an issue that's been brought up by by many, many of you and us uh, and even in the literature that it's hard to find adult providers that will um, have this this program in place and knowledge about the condition and, and so forth. So this is really highlighted in the principles here. And then the last but not least, the pediatric team will communicate with that um, identified adult provider to make sure that the provider number one agrees to accept the patient um, and then make sure that there's a typo there that, that an appointment is made and kept. So really to make sure that that, that actually happens and the provider accepts the patient um, and just just making sure that it's established and there's a solid plan going forward. So those are the eight principles. Um, again, we focus on these two because they're related to the adult uh, care and our survey was more adult driven and, and based rather than pediatric. Again, if you have, if you guys have any questions, please just stop me. Now, moving on to uh, uh, voices in uh, Marianne's papers, I think Dr. Davinsky was, was on this paper as well from 2020, where I think 18 uh, families of Dravet, I believe through the foundation, mostly, at least most of them, um, on Facebook, um, they had a, a, they had a group, a group on Facebook and they, they were asked about a lot of um, barriers related to transition uh, and they were presented in this paper. I just uh, kind of picked the ones that are related again to, to our side of things from the adult side. Um, they broke down different barriers and issues uh, uh, by the age of the patient. So these are the ones that were highlighted for patients that are age uh, 19 and above. Um, so either in the transitioning or transitioned kind of phase of, of, their, of their care of their lives. Um, and just to go over them really quickly, so some of them are that, again, uh, it's hard for, for caregivers and, and providers in general from the adult, from the pediatric side to find adult neurologists who are knowledgeable about Dravet syndrome. Uh, it's hard to, 
to ensure that uh, we as adult providers understand and are comfortable with the fact that caregivers take a large role in the patient's care. Um, and we talk about that quite a bit. And I think this is, it's, it really comes from the fact that most of our patients are able to make their decisions. So from a you know, prevalence standpoint, frequency standpoint, most of the patients that we see are able to make decisions for, um, for their own. So um, um, that's where I think it kind of comes from. But regardless, it needs to be addressed and that needs to be understood by the adult providers. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Um, also, the third big point here is that uh, the, the adult providers need to understand that uh, there needs to be that advocacy assessment of these patients and, and asked uh, the parents and sometimes with um, neuropsychologic and psychiatric assessments to, to see if they're able to, to self-advocate and, and, and make decisions or not, and if not, kind of take care of that accordingly. Um, the strong care coordination is also something that's that's an issue, um, and I think that derives from the fact that uh, it's really hard to have programs that have uh, that take care of a lot of the coordination of care outside of neurologic care um, overall, including in the transition process. So that was another issue brought up. Um, and then just a few more remarks here um, that were presented by by those um, by those authors by that group is that there's a lot of patients that really will stay with their pediatric epileptologist indefinitely and that's not an ideal solution. Uh, and then, as you know, there's a lot of issues that derive from that. Uh, for example, the children's hospital, the, the pediatric hospital, not being able to accommodate patients when they need to come in or have exams and, and MRIs and have the resources in the environment that's really needed for, for patients uh, uh, that have intellectual disability or behavioral issues, as, as we all know. Uh, and we're gonna get back to this in our survey because it's very similar. All right, so this is, what, uh, this is what's been presented by, by their team in 2020. Um, I'm happy to see uh, uh, Ms. Sawyer here. Uh, we recently uh, wrote a letter to, to the editor and it was just published in Epileptic Disorders, where we gave both the, the, the patient perspective, so Ms. Ms. Sawyer's and all the moms that she said dads that she's talked to um, uh, over time. And then we gave our, our, our perspectives as well on the issues that were, that were discussed and, and challenges. Um, so it's, it's pretty short. I think it's a nice summary of what, what the issues are, both from from a caregiver standpoint and from a provider standpoint. And I don't want to talk about this too much. That's not the goal today, but you know, there's a lot of provider issues as well that sometimes are not as known by caregivers, I believe, just because it's a different environment and field. But I'm just going to mention one um, that I'm actually living right now as, I, as I'm creating our own transition program is that um, uh, for example, that first visit where ideally we should have the adult provider and the pediatric provider at the same time to, to make that connection with the family the first time and kind of pass off the care to the adult provider. Um, that's hard in the real world because people are busy, their schedules are busy, and um, there's no way to, 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 to bill for, for one visit for two providers at the same time. And um, that plays a role, especially if, if you're an institution where um, you have to hit a, a, a certain uh, uh, workload. And as, as you'd expect, it, it, there's, there's some structural issues that come from that that make it a little bit more difficult to providers. So we just talk about that and, and a few more on, on that letter, uh, just to give an overall perspective. All right. Keep going. So, um, so now focus on the survey. So we, again, we know it's complicated. We talk about it. We wrote that letter about it, but we wanted to hear from more caregivers about what issues there are out there in terms of transition to be able to understand it better and, and therefore be able to address and improve the system altogether. So uh, our team at, um, in Boston created in collaboration with uh, with Marianne, Veronica, all of you guys in the, in the foundation, Ms. Sawyer, all the moms and caregivers that helped us curate the, the survey as well. Uh, this 34 question uh, questionnaire that um, included some demographics of our patients, a little bit of clinical features, and then a lot of details on the transition pro process itself. 
if it was present. Um, we are we decided to include number one patients that had the diagnosis of Dravet syndrome um, to really make that um, specific to to our uh, to our syndrome to our patients to our community, and we made sure that they're adults, um, so they're 18 years of age or older, and they were residing in the U.S. Uh, like I mentioned, the, the survey was disseminated through through the foundation by by email newsletters and. Um, and social media. This is just a screenshot of the first page of our, of our survey here. So just a little bit more now about the results. So we got 57 responses and I'm sure most or a lot of them are from you guys attending today. So I appreciate you alls I know it's a lot of time and there's a lot on your plates already. And just to take the time to, to fill out a 34 question um, survey is, is a lot. So we all appreciate it. Uh, we unfortunately had to exclude some of them, mostly because the patients, uh, those patients were not either uh, adults or they were not residing in the US, so we ultimately included 46. Uh, the mean age at the time of the study was 24 years, ranging from 18 to 37, or old, oldest patient was 37. And the mean age of diagnosis was 12 years, ranging from uh, a diagnosis in the first year of life, so zero in the first year of life to 37 years of age. Um, when we asked where they, they resided, um, most um, uh, resided in the suburban area, and then um, some of them in urban area and less frequently in rural area. And it was almost one to one ratio as far as, as, far as sex. Um, so this is the, uh, the interesting part that we're going to talk a little bit more about. So from that total of 46 that we got complete responses from, 37% um, so like a little bit more than a third did undergo a transition or were undergoing transition at the time, whereas two thirds ish did not. Um, so this is an issue in and of itself and just try to get that big number uh, or portion of patients that are adults uh, that did not transition is, is I think it's very informative. Uh, so let's start with the ones that did not transition. So those uh, two thirds out of the total that we had and we asked why they were not transitioned. So this is kind of, again, I think it's known by most of us, but it's, um, I think it was interesting to, again, to, to establish and document that number. So the number one cause for adults to not have been transitioned is that they're still followed by their pediatric provider, um, the vast majority actually. So it kind of reflects the issues that number one, it's. There's not a lot of transition programs out there. Number two, it's hard to find a provider. So I think it kind of sums up all that we already know as far as challenges. Um, so that was that was the first kind of the first reason here. The second is that this is sad from a from a system standpoint. I think we need to improve both. Um, is that they were really discharged from pediatric clinic in the sense that uh, we saw some comments from the caregivers and they were mostly in this in the sense of that they really said, look, I can't, the pediatric team um, reached a point where they couldn't care for the patient anymore for whatever reason. Um, we know that a lot of institutions from the pediatric side will have a cutoff um, and they were, and they had to, to let the patient go without necessarily being able to find a transition program for them to go through or a provider that would take, um, that will be uh, received the care of the patient uh, because of all the issues that we already know. Um, again, so it's both are sad, uh, unfortunately, um, more, more so, I guess, the, the second point here, but in, in sad in the sense that we need, to, we need to find a way to do better from a community standpoint. Um, the third point is that they were already diagnosed by a dope provider. So, so these ones are okay. So that's a good reason to not have undergone transition. So they didn't undergo transition because they were diagnosed as adults and they were already cared for by the adult provider at the end of the day. So there's no point. Uh, and then there's some other um, um, other reasons that was the minority. So that's for the patients that did not undergo transition. Now, the ones that did undergo transition, um, again, around um, one third, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about, about those uh, uh, in particular now. So they were first seen by an adult provider between the ages of 18 and 28. So the mean being 22 years. And they, they started the conversation about transition with their pediatric providers at around uh, 18, uh, 19 years of age, ranging from 16 to 27. Um, again, uh, comparing with that, with those eight common principles by the Child Knowledge Society, 
it, uh, the mean age of 19 is a little bit old um, as it should happen around the, the age of uh, 13 years. But again, just to put it into perspective, um, that's the information we have for, for the ones that did undergo transition again in our study. And we went uh, one step further and we asked, again, those that did undergo transition or were undergoing transition at the time, how they would rate their perceptions as to the adult provider or team. And um, I'm going to show you a little bit of, of that now. Uh, we included, uh, just to give you guys a uh, localization here, so we included often and always as good, so they're green, and never, rarely, and sometimes as, as red as they're, they're not good. Um, so we asked the, the caregivers if the adult team addressed the fact that a lot of our patients are not capable of self-advocacy, and um, uh, most of them, most of the providers uh, do not address that fact. So that's, a, that's an area of improvement. Uh, we asked whether the adult team or adult provider uh, would, uh, would be aware of the potential legal guardianship and end-of-life decision-making issues, and um, the majority uh, would not. So that's, uh, that's an issue as well. And unfortunately, most of the adult care teams receiving uh, the care of our Dravé patients in the adult side do not include a multidisciplinary team. Um, and that was the majority, majority of the respondents here. Um, we asked a few more questions. Um, again, um, here they're, they're, they're grouped similarly. So for moderately or very much, they're good, so they're green. Uh, for not at all, slightly or somewhat, they're, they're red, so they're not good. Um, again, asking about the adult care team, the adult provider, um, if they're attentive and available, so most of them are, so that's, that's good. Uh, if they're knowledgeable about Dravet, especially in adults, most of them are as well. If they're knowledgeable about including caregivers in the clinical decision making and fostering that collaboration with caregivers, those that that the majority of the adult teams as well. Um, if they were knowledgeable about caring for patients with intellectual disability and or behavioral issues, that was most uh, respondents as well. And if they were attentive and able to offer uh, accommodations related to potential behavioral and cognitive issues, that was the majority as well. Um, before we keep going, I just want to make, make, a, make a pause here really quickly. Uh, we're going to talk about the limitations of the study, but uh, and I'm sure you guys have a lot of very good and insightful ideas about this. I think that this is a little bit exaggerated because the we're just asking the families that did undergo a transition, which would imply that those patients are in a bigger center to go to specialists that know more about Gervais. Um, so I think we need to kind of keep that in mind when we're looking at this numbers here is hopefully it's like this everywhere. Um, but there is there is a chance that this is it's not this good um, for for the other programs or the other adult teams out there. Um, and then um, to wrap up, we asked their overall rating of the transition process the, for again for the ones that did undergo transition and two thirds said that it was good, very good or excellent, and about a third, a little bit more than a third, said that it was fair or poor. Um, just to wrap up now, again, in terms of limitations, um, we have a good number, but relatively, I think it's 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 somewhat low. We know there's a lot of a lot more uh, patients out there in, in in our country and and beyond and abroad. Um, so it's relatively low sample. Um, it's retrospective, and as we all know, for every study, uh, when we depend on our recollection, it it can be biased by um, a lot of different things. So if you have a good good report with the drug provider or whatnot that might influence or impact your your answers uh, and just recalling things is, is something hard for all of us sometimes um, so there's that potential bias as well and then the third one i think is the one i just mentioned is we're asking the families that actually did undergo the transition process so presumably um, uh, they had a better system to take care of those patients otherwise they wouldn't have undergone or the transition process wouldn't exist in the first place. Um, so this one, and then the second selection bias is that we're uh, uh, just overall, we, we probably captured the caregivers that um, um, are, they're, they're more involved or more active or have more access to the internet and surveys and are uh, uh, networking with the foundation. Um, so we have to keep that in mind as well. Um, that could be a selection bias that could, that could impact our results. 
but um, having said that, I think that was uh, that was our big picture and in interpretation of the data. So just before I stop talking, just to make some conclusions here based on our numbers. So two thirds of adults with Gervais in the U.S., the ones that we that we captured, um, did not undergo a transition of care, uh, and the number one reason being that they were still followed by pediatric providers. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, um, adult teams receiving care uh, failed to make sure that uh, that they address concerns about legal guardianship end of life making decision uh decision making and self-advocacy uh, number three uh, the adult teams fail to consistently have that multidisciplinary comprehensive teen approach when they receive care uh, and then our overall recommendation that's intuitive is that we we think that there should be more accessible transition programs that are really uh, tailored to what our patients need uh, which might not be the same for other patients with neurologic conditions or even other types of, of epilepsies um, to make sure that, that that's really in place uh, and uh, we can we can have that resource uh, available to the community, to patients and, and caregivers. So I think that's, oh, I just wanted to, yeah, to show a few pictures here. So I always show the same pictures. Um, so this is Dr. Gervais that I had the pleasure of meeting uh, a few years back in Canada. I always include that picture in every Gervais talk. Uh, and this is our team. So this is Dr. Teal, my mentor and friend from MGH. We have Marianne and Veronica. This is Dr. Sheikh and, and Samantha who um, did the study with me. And so this is the this is our team that, that conducted this survey study and uh, work hard on, on getting this out there and interpreting the results and creating the survey and, and everything. So that's all, that's what I had. So. Great, thank you so much. Um, we did get a question that came in from Barb in the chat. Um, I can read it. So she's asking um, for your specific take on what the ideal age is for moving from pediatric to adult neurology. Um, so her local children's hospital is doing a lot of work around transition, but sometimes also encouraging patients to stay until age 25 to get past the other transition milestones like aging out of school, guardianship, et cetera. Do you think, you know, there is any issues that would arise with sort of pushing it back a little bit as long as your main hospital is okay with that? Um, what would you think about that situation? Yeah, no, that, that's a great point. And before I give my personal opinion, I think it's important to, to put out there that it is a personal opinion. Unfortunately, there's a lot of research on Dreve, but they're all personal opinions. Um, there's no outcomes-based research. We don't know if transitioning at 18 or 35 is better as far as outcomes and and uh, and and, and uh, perceptions of families and patients and and whatnot. So uh, that's one of the things that I, I I dislike that I think we need to change in the world of transition is a science and it should be taken as a science. Expert opinion is the lower level of evidence that we have. But this is a pet peeve of mine, so I'm not going to keep going. But uh, based on what I've seen so far, I think I think it it really depends on the center you have. And I'm seeing that from from WashU. I think if you have the transition program in place, you know that there's me on the other side and and hopefully more providers that will uh, will be part of the program in the future as it grows. Um, I don't think it matters that much as far as when to start the discussion, because the, the, one, one way or the other, the patients will know that the system is there and there's a possibility uh, and they can undergo that that path um, if they would like, which um, uh, which is really nice. Um, so the age, the cutoff to start the conversation, I think depends more to patient to patient. Some some families might might be very overwhelmed and you might have to delay it a little bit, whereas some others um, might, it will be probably nice to know earlier rather than later. Um, so that's number one. And then the second question, I think pushing the cutoff is totally fine as far as, uh, as long as the there's a structure, like you mentioned, to, to, to support that. Uh, for example, if the, if the pediatric hospital will accept a patient to be admitted if there's status or if there's a, if there's a, you know just a resource overall that will be able to accommodate uh, adults, I think that's reasonable. And at uh, for example, and I know you know this, Ms. Sawyer at MGH, it's the same hospital for both pediatric and adults, so that's not big of an issue because they're going to come to the same hospital anyway. Um, here for me, it's a little bit different because they're two separate hospitals, but still, it's the same team. We know each other. It's literally across the street, so it's not a big issue as well. But in other centers, um, 
if if they're very separate, they're separate teams, physically they're located very far away, I think that there might be a bigger issue. So I think it depends on the system. <clears throat> we have a couple other questions. Um, I'm going to skip out of order because I think this builds off what we were just talking about. Um, are transition programs for patients with Dravet syndrome best managed by children's hospitals um, with or doctors and partnerships with local affiliated adult hospital providers? So I guess I think maybe what you're asking is who should sort of lead the transition program? Should it be on the pediatric side or the adult side, I think is what the question is possibly getting at and whether, yeah, who leads it? So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it depends on the definition of leading. Um, I think there is there should be responsibility for both sides. Uh, for example, one of the things that I'm trying really to, to, to get a nice workflow is how to make sure that here it's not, again, here it's not a big issue, but for some centers, how to, how to get access to the records from the other hospital. And sometimes that's an issue of an, in and of itself. And that might be the responsibility of the pedi pediatric team to make sure that it's available to the adult provider. But then when it comes to you know, providing nursing staff and somebody to take the calls and, and provide uh, other types of care and care overall, then it will be more the adult side. So I, I think from a system standpoint, from what I've seen so far, I think probably the adult team will, will, will lead uh, the transition since we're receiving care at that moment, the patient is ours. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the pediatric team doesn't have um, uh, some duties and responsibilities, responsibilities as well. Great. Um, <clears throat> the other question, uh, which I might even chime in a little bit too, or ask Marianne what she wants to chime in is, mm -hmm. Would a package of resources that emphasize guardianship, medical care, supportive therapies, education and vocational and enrichment programming and housing meet the need of transitioning families? And is that list comprehensive enough or is there something else needed on that list? Um, so we are working on these types of resources for families from the foundation. Uh, Marianne's been doing a lot of of work on that. And we had kind of a pilot of some of it at the conference. Um, I don't know, Marianne, if you notice anything missing off that list, Fabio, if you miss notice anything missing um, that we should be thinking about when we're developing these. And certainly from the provider perspective, Fabio, are there things that you see that should also be on that list? Marianne, you want to go first? <laughs> throw me under the bus. Yeah, I, think, I think that, you know, what we have seen is a big challenge for our families is it's not even just um, going through the transition process, but finding the time to start thinking about it. And so these initial tools that we've been working on are more of a checklist, trying to get an idea um, and help them get a timeline of that in their head of things that they should be addressing. It, as Veronica said, we are in the very early stages there, and I am sure there are some things that are missing. We've been relying heavily on parents who've already gone through the process, um, but I, I think there's definitely a lot of room for improvement and more resources that are needed. But I don't know, you know, coming from, um, you know, a provider perspective, is there something that a parent could bring into you, for instance, on their first visit with you that would be helpful in that transition process? Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, just before my disclaimer is that I don't have a lot of experience with it because we're just starting. But based on what I've seen, yeah, I think not just through the transition program, but any adult provider, it's really hard. Uh, and we've had this conversation with an industry and in another study that we're, that we're doing, right, Marianne and Veronica. But um, it's hard for us to know. Uh, it's easier for us to know what's needed, but it's hard for us to make it happen. Uh, so as far as legal guardianship decision making and the need for other social work case management even lawyers uh, that's something that we're not really used to we're not familiar so we don't even know where who to refer to how to how to refer in that sense it's not through epic most of the times or who to talk to and so maybe having some sort of guideline in that regard would help again if if it's part of a transition program that should be established already so you should have a list of names of people that you ask for help but if it's not through the transition, let's say it's a general or epileptologist in the community in the private practice, then it's really hard for that person to know how to navigate that system. So that, that will be one, one thing that I would comment on. And I think that's something we can further develop. I think um, 
where we're struggling a little bit more, is there specific, for instance, past medical records or information that would be useful for you on that first visit transitioning? Or is it just as easy for you to flip through medical records? What would mm. be beneficial for you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're, I'm, I'm putting together an, uh, uh, based on a lot of the uh, Canadian work and the Ontario recommendations, a pediatric discharge package. Um, and the, the one that I like the most in there is the epilepsy history form, uh, which summarizes all the history in terms of just history of the epilepsy, medications, treatments used, diet therapy, surgery, neurostimulation, and then all the tests possible that are relevant to us. But I don't think that would lie on y'all's jurisdiction. I think that should be dealt with by the pediatric provider and team to sum, sum up and, and send it off to the adult team. So that's my view, yeah. I see Barb shaking her head because I think that's the ideal scenario, but that's not mm -hmm. what's happening. Um, I think that's been my biggest learning through all of this is you know, when I, when I started talking about transition with everyone, I was like, well, here's all the things the doctors should be helping with. And then I very quickly realized like, there's a lot of reasons that they don't. And there's a lot of reasons that they can't do all the things that they need to, um, you know, some advocacy would help in getting them more involved, but it's frustrating because there's no one point person to help guide you through all of the process of transition. Um, so I think one of the things we've been thinking about, and Barb, I'm sorry, I've stepped over, I'm sure you can share, but it's just what can we give families to sort of help the pediatric provider <coughs> get that summary that I makes see. sense to the adult providers. Um, yeah. Barb, I'll let you chime in and add what, you know, what your frustration has been. Yeah, no, I, I honestly think on the pediatric side, it's almost just a problem of time and energy and pulling it together. And I don't, you know, it depends also on how the parent operates. Like I literally have a file cabinet with a folder of every year of Jake's medical stuff. And so sometimes it's almost faster to me to say, oh yeah, in 2014 and he had an MRI, let me pull up the letter. And in our case, our adult hospital was connected through medical records to the pediatric hospital, but you also in my opinion, cannot expect an adult provider to comb through those records. There's just, there's thousands of pages. So when we did it, I just wrote a two page, I tried to keep it under two pages of here's the meds we've tried, here's the genetic testing we've done, here's the tests we've sort of had recently, and here are our current issues. And then we just went from there. But it took a lot of there was no, like, um, Fabia, when you're talking about this epilepsy history form, that would have been really nice to have. And I still think that's such an important piece because I just made it up and mm -hmm. I figured, here's what I think this provider wants to know. Mm -hmm. And then the other point that I'm just going to make, you know, as part of the conversation that I was jotting down, it's important for the adult neurologist to have that. But what I'm finding is, you know, most of us have probably five to 10 other specialists. And we are slowly one at a time churning through these specialists moving from PD to adult. It's taken me already a year and a half and we're still not done. And what I'm finding is as a parent with every single new specialist, you sort of have to go through the same educational process, even like we're going to urology and kidney stone clinic. And I show up to get a CAT scan and and the hospital, you know, the staff is like, oh, are you going to go in with Jake? And I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, yeah, you could take him if you want. But so it's just, yeah. it's not only educating on neurology, but it's, mm -hmm. it's a lot about the um, capability of the patient and the level of dependence, which most of them have, and then trying to work the system with a fully dependent adult child which is also just a huge, it's been a huge piece of it, at least in my experience. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I didn't, I didn't really have that understanding. I think it's really helpful. Um, I don't know how much it would be good for, for caregivers, but I am happy to share the list that we keep, that I came up with and I'm um, kind of trying to implement as far as history, epilepsy, uh, history form. Um, there's a lot of lingo, like medical lingo, but that can be that can be adapted to 
less, although you guys probably know all of them better than we do. But um, but but yeah, I think if, if it's something helpful and actually I can I can even share that if we have time. Do we have time, Veronica? Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, so let me I think share. Something else I just want to make sure that I mention is that we do have the transition of care document um, on the website. So it's linked in several places, but you can find it under the adult caregiver um, tabs. But it's not going to be specific to your child, but if you need a primer for a new doctor on what is Gervais syndrome and what are the, you know, top, you know, considerations for adults with Gervais syndrome, we do have that on the website. And it may also be another good starting place for you to think about, okay, within these topics, what's specific to my, you know, loved one and what do I need to provide expanded information under this topic on. So just wanted to make sure everyone knows that resource is there too. Go ahead, Fabio. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, no worries. And again, this this is probably a lot more detailed than than what would be um, better for for caregivers. But just for you guys to have an idea. So this is what I came up with really recently, based on what I've read um, so far and the experience that I've that I've had. So it, it's really a, a four a five sections. So there's epilepsy history section. There's treatments, comorbidities, the exam, and uh, and then tests. I think for caregivers, the test section will probably be the best especially if they have access and reports and the raw data for all those, but just going one by one really quickly. So the epilepsy history, there's, you know, there's some syndrome ideology that'll be easy for, for, for Gervais. And then when decisions started, the febrile seizures, the, this, how they look like prior and currently, uh, and then the frequency, the triggers, um, if there's status epilepticas, if there's clustering and there's family history. Um, again, a lot of this is very technical, um, and so that may include some training in the medical field to be able to make sure that we're talking about the same thing. So that might that might have to be adapted a little bit, but um, but I'm going to show you anyway. So treatments, this is more objective. So the, what are the current seizure meds and the doses and the duration of the therapy? That I think the caregivers probably will know that better than us. Uh, the rescue um, seizure meds and the doses, the prior and the failed ones, um, specifying the highest dose and why it was stopped. Other meds, including psychiatric contraceptives, if that's the case. Uh, and this is not just for Gervais syndrome, this is more for transition in, in general. Uh, calcium and vitamin D, folic acid, etc. If there's epilepsy surgery, including neurostimulation, if so, the procedure type, uh, uh, some details about it and, and dates, uh, and then there's the dietary therapy. And then comorbidities, basically in terms of cognition, um, and then who determined that? So if it's a it's a neuropsychologist or a psychiatrist or the or the family, um, so that's that. And then if there's psychiatric comorbidities, like ought. And then on Ep, this is supposed to be for Epic. So on Epic, I have like a scroll down menu that you can click on. But here it'll be for for example, depression, anxiety, autism spectrum disorder, behavioral mm -hmm. aggressiveness, and things of that sort. Um, and then other medical issues. And then lastly, the exam, which again, my, my, this one might be tough for caregivers that are not in the medical field to, to know exactly how to describe the issues, but the tests I think will be key. Um, so there's, there's imaging, there's scans, there's EEG stuff, genetics and metabolic. Metabolic, not as important in some cases. Um, and then I, I wanted to make sure that we have the dates of the exams and the relevant findings. So this will be probably the impression interpretation the conclusion of the report and then we have the cat scan and MRI and these ones are more for people that have gone pre-surgical evaluations so not as important so CT and MRI probably would be the big ones and then EEGs same thing the dates the findings again the interpretation the conclusion so for routines if they're ambulatory meaning they're longer they're like 24 hours that they do at home they take the cap at home and then come back to take it off at the hospital and then if they've been on in the epilepsy monitoring unit and what that showed and then other fancier surgical tests like meg um, and then genetic tests again same same deal and then what type of test it is the date and the finding um, and i remember a, a lecture by dr uh, uh, helbig at the gervais uh, foundation conference that we just had and uh, i think he made that point really clearly that was really i think it was, it was beautiful that um, it would be really nice if caregivers could write down the particular variant because that might be interpreted differently depending on what time we are and the information we have at that point in time. So um, yeah, so that's what I have. And, and again, if, if you guys think it's helpful, I'm happy to share this and adapt this to a more 
less technical term, again, if, if it's helpful. I think it would be really helpful, Fabio, um, if you wanted to put that, uh, even just send it in a rough draft yeah. over to Marion and I, we could adapt it and share with everyone, it'd be great. Okay, yeah. And one step further, if we could, I guess it's more like a project, I guess, but if if we could uh, create, there's, there's some HIPAA things that we probably need to work out, but um, if there would be a way to create like a website or some sort of portal where each of these would be a text box and you can just click on, or there's even a menu that you could just pick, for example, seizure meds, there's a list of seizure meds and you just click on the ones that you know your, your kid has, has tried in the past. Um, that would be really, that's essentially creating a database through the foundation for all the families. And then yeah. that can be shared with the provider um, on a case by case basis, depending on who you see, they can have access to just the, your patient's information. So yeah. it might be something where we would do it as like a fillable PDF or something like that. So that the foundation didn't have to try to manage the, you know, medical privacy stuff, but that could be easy for families to fill out and sort of take, yeah. um, or I don't know, we can talk about different options, right. ways to make it easiest without yeah. us to navigate. Right that. I think that is most of the questions. Are there, you know, people asking hopefully for you to provide this because it would be really yeah. great. Um, just a comment, a, a reminder that this is obviously fantastic for that neurology transition, but going to have to be adapted um, for, for the other specialists. Right. I think think I think that gets us to the end um I want to thank you again so much uh for coming in on a Saturday to talk to us about this and for the the work you're doing we're so excited that you're starting this transition clinic and that hopefully um you know a lot of families are going to have successful transitions at your clinic yeah. um but yeah thank you and thanks to all of our caregivers that came today um We'll be sharing the recording from today out with everyone. I shared some links in the chat today, but also I'll make sure I reshare in the caregiver group that awesome letter to the editor that um, Barb and Fabio collaborated on. Make sure everybody got to see that. Um, but yeah, that'll end the webinar today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.